Hello, and welcome to the interview with me, Willie Lowry. In this series, we explore the relationship between the U.S. and the Middle East. With leading voices from both sides, we peel back the layers and get to the heart of what really drives American interests in the region. In the immediate aftermath of Hamas's shocking attack on October 7th, and as Israel began its military response in Gaza, U.S. President Joe Biden tasked one man to ensure that humanitarian aid reached desperate civilians in the besieged Palestinian enclave. That man was Ambassador David Satterfield. He spent four decades at the State Department working in and on the Middle East, and is widely considered one of Washington's most insightful and knowledgeable voices on the region. For six months, while he served as Special Envoy for Middle East Humanitarian Issues, Ambassador Satterfield worked to increase the flow of aid into Gaza. But now, aid is once again at dangerously low levels, and hunger stalks Gaza's population. Has the U.S. done enough? Ambassador Satterfield, thank you so much for joining us. The U.N. recently said that essentially no aid had entered Gaza since the beginning of October. In recent days, that's changed, but only by the tiniest of trickles. How concerned are you by the situation right now in Gaza, particularly in the north? And are you worried about famine? I'm extraordinarily concerned uh, about the situation in Gaza, not just the north, but the center and the south where the bulk of the population live. Look, at the end of April, the beginning of May, the combined amount of humanitarian and commercial goods, which, which were important, coming into Gaza, we're running 400, 450, sometimes close to 500 trucks a day. That level was enough to prevent famine or starvation in the north as well as in the center and the south. We're about to pivot away from that to be able to move targeted, specialized medical care, feeding assistance to vulnerable communities, pregnant, nursing, women, newborns, young children, those with pre-existing conditions. That was all literally put aside by the initiation of the Rafa campaign. We had cautioned Israel, we know you need to operate in Rafa. We didn't challenge that at all. You need to break up, disrupt, diminish those Hamas battalions present in Rafa. We got it. We support you on that. But before you initiate that campaign, you've got to do two things. You have to prepare for a million people moving out of Rafa. You've got to have shelter, medical care, basic humanitarian support, food and water for them. That's a huge undertaking. That was step one. The step two was you know you're going to disrupt the movement of humanitarian assistance when this campaign begins. So have alternate routes out of Karim Shalom. Rafa is going to close. We, we know that. But Karim Shalom has to stay open and has to stay fully functional. So you've got to have new routes out. The Israeli response was, we understand, and we'll do that. This will be a conditions-based offensive, not a, a calendar, not a timeline-based offensive. But did they do it? No, they did not. When Hamas mortared and killed IDF soldiers outside of Karim Shalom, May 6th, May 7th, the Israeli campaign began. There were no alternate routes functional. There were no provisions made for what indeed was a million people moving, just as we had predicted. Where we were wrong is we understated the magnitude of the humanitarian disaster which this would produce. It was worse than you thought. It was worse than we thought because law and order broke down completely. And on top of the physical problems which we had predicted, how do you move stuff out of Karim Shalom to distribution points in the midst of a campaign? How do you provide for a million people on the move when the seven or 800,000 that preceded them on the move aren't adequately cared for? So I, I cannot overstate on behalf of, of my own analysis, the international humanitarian community's analysis, this is a true disaster. It has grown in magnitude since May. You asked, is there starvation or famine? Now, normally, you'd be able to look to international judgments. The IPC makes assessments on risk of famine, risk of starvation. It's very hard for them to do that right now because the situation is so disrupted on the ground, so opaque 
that the kinds of quantifications necessary here can't be easily made, but I am confident in saying the risk of starvation, the risk of famine, even if it is only in localized places, is more significant today than it has been at any point since beginning of the year, end of last year. If you look at the Israeli government's own data on aid into Gaza over the course of this war, it essentially looks like a bell curve, kind of reaching its peak while you were reaching the end of your tenure. In, end of end April, of, beginning of May. And then slowly declining. No, it's not a slow decline. It's a precipitous well, decline. Well, exactly. If you get to October this month, it's essentially fallen off a cliff. It is next to nothing. Is the Israeli government engaged in a policy of starve or leave? I do not assess that there is a deliberate policy, now or in the past, of starvation as a, a policy tool and instrument of war. But how do you explain such little food and aid going in? Because the problem that has been with all of us, all of us, the international community, the United States, Israel itself, since October 8, the day after the massacre, which is a humanitarian campaign, which is pursued with the same vigor, consistency, commitment as the kinetic campaign. That's never been the case. The U.S. does not regard Israel as an occupying power in Gaza, but we do regard them as responsible under international humanitarian law for provision of the necessary circumstances, security, and environment for the distribution of aid. At what point will they be breaking that? The letter that has been reported in the press and now accepted as, as sent by the administration makes very clear the specific actions which the U.S. looks to Israel to take within the next 30 days. Why 30 days? Because some of these steps can't be done overnight. They can't be done in a week or two. They're going to take several weeks to implement. And they do speak to the volume, uh, the quantifiable volume of aid that has to come in, 350 trucks a day. That, even that, is below the numbers yeah. necessary. But it would mitigate risk of starvation and famine. Security. Israel is responsible for providing security so that that aid, when it moves, can be distributed in the face of these violent criminal gangs to the people in need. That there can be no policy of forcible displacement from North Gaza. Now, Israel is denied there is any such policy. But that letter makes very clear the grave concerns the administration has that such a policy, de facto or more formally be adopted, cannot happen, that there must be the ability to get food and assistance to the north as well as to the center and south, and that an additional crossing be opened into the north, and a variety of other specific steps, none of which are new. Well, this is, this is, this is my next point. I mean, you, while you were still in your, your position, Secretary Blinken sent a very similar letter in April. It seemed to, to work. But all of these strongly worded letters, these meetings, this pressure that, that Washington has been putting on Israel, it doesn't seem to be working. Does the U.S. need to go further? Is a potential arms embargo something that they need to entertain in order to protect civilians? The, the curve that you referred to, which was a steadily progressive one, and dramatically so, from October 21, the first 20 trucks of assistance moving in, until the 6th of May, this was the consequence not just of happenstance, no. It was because of constant day and night engagement with the prime minister, with his most senior security cabinet members, with the active IDF and COGAT, the coordinator for government activities in the territories, officials responsible for all of this, on our part, our coordination with the international humanitarian community, literally around the clock, every day of the week. It was the President of the United States picking up the phone and calling with very specific requests. It was Jake Sullivan. It was Tony Blinken, Brett McGurk. It was me interacting constantly, both with each other 
It was a whole of government approach and it produced results. Now you asked the question which everyone asks, so what if it doesn't work? When do you invoke greater pressures? I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals, the what ifs. I will say this. But it's not really a hypothetical if it's not working at the moment, right? We believe because we saw a successful exercise of this directive, determinative U.S. engagement with the international community, with the Israeli government at the highest levels over this long period from October. You remember Yoav Gallant's comments on 9 of October, not one ounce of fuel, not one drop of water, not one ounce of food is going to go in there until the hostages come out. Well, that was the 9th of October. By the 21st of October, trucks were moving, then fuel, then lots more trucks. That's got to be resumed. If it does not resume, what that letter carefully says is that we will have to make assessments given U.S. law as to potential consequences for assistance. That is a phrasing which I think speaks for itself and about which I would not elaborate further. So then do you attribute the current lack of aid then to a, a fatigue within the administration of, of, of kind of no longer able to mount that full court pressure that, that you were referring to that was so successful? I believe it is a consequence of the Israeli government pursuing a kinetic campaign in Gaza. My assessment is since mid-June, the diminishing returns from that campaign are offset by the increasing harms, deficits done, created for Israel, first and foremost, for the United States, for the region, for our collective partners around the world. In the words of the President, frankly, in the words of the Israeli Minister of Defense and Chief of Staff, it's time for this to come to an end. Uh, I want to talk about the peer. The U.S. spent roughly $230 million building Mm -hmm. this floating pier off Gaza that essentially lasted about two months, delivered roughly 8,000 metric tons of delivery or the equivalent of Mm -hmm. 600 trucks. That's what the UN says it needs over a two-day period. What happened? The pier served two purposes. First, if we're looking at the motivations, the issue of a pier had been discussed within the administration for quite some time. The desperate situation that confronted northern Gaza at the time the president ordered that the military move the pier, he knew, we all knew, a maritime delivery of assistance like parachuted, airdropped assistance is an extremely um, inefficient from a cost and delivery standpoint way to get humanitarian aid in, to get it in by land. We knew that, but we were ourselves consumed with, and I think this was the morally correct thing to do, consumed by the need to exhaust every possible option in our hands. So this was simply the U.S. trying to make it look like they were doing something. Trying to make it look? Absolutely not. And I respond with some vigor to that. It was the desire to get aid in in any way we could. It was not a game. It was not theater. Military were not happy with this. They didn't want to have to commit those resources. The president ordered them to do it because he saw the situation in the North where we saw the risk of starvation, the risk, because it was never clear, as certainly present, that for us to have a potential means of getting aid in and not use it, Even if it was inefficient and costly, it was the morally correct thing to do, and that was the motivation and the justification, not theater. But it did something else. The fact that we were willing to take on this extraordinary burden and commitment paralleled with the president's direct injunctions to the prime minister and ours to his government that as we do this, you've got to do things on your own. You have got to open up Ashdod Port. You've got to open up additional direct crossings into the north. You've got to expedite the inspection process. All of this came 
if you will, as a parallel package, without the peer, our ability to impact and impress these other steps on Israel would have been diminished. And that point has not been appreciated. I want to go back to the comments that you made about Yo that Yoav Galat made at the very beginning of this war. He, of course, was not the only uh, Israeli official to make such, such remarks. Uh, Minister of National Security Itamar Ben Gavir made similar uh, statements. These statements were the antithesis of your very job, your very mission uh, while over there. What was it like working with, with this historically far-right administration? And were they actually receptive to the needs of Palestinians? It was very clear after the initial very difficult exchanges which Secretary Blinken had that first weekend after October 7th, and then when the president came, two things were obvious. First, the trauma, the shock that had impacted Israel as a society, as a nation, and particularly the security establishment. They'd failed. They had failed in their fundamental duty to protect the people of Israel. In, in stunning and unprecedented fashion. And that impact was clear to all of us. But something else became clear by the time the president departed, which was there was a way forward. There was an understanding that a humanitarian campaign had to be conducted. And because we saw it begin in the immediate aftermath, 72 hours, 48 hours after the president departed Israel on the 19th, and we saw the continued progress, the dramatic progress made all through the end of the year. Some setbacks, yes, but particularly after February, March of this year, with each week that passed, more crossings, direct access of goods into Ashdod port and from Ashdod into the north, the dramatically increased volume of assistance that could be inspected and processed into Gaza through Karim Shalom secondarily through Rafa. This gave us not just hope, we saw reality here, which was one that we could work with and advance. It was the Rafa campaign and the failure by Israel to make provision for the suitable displacement of those million folks that came out of Rafa and the lack, frankly, until just about now of alternate routes, which only now are being contemplated months into this campaign. That's what set us back, but you asked me how was to deal with them. They were professional, they were excellent interlocutors, and we collectively made progress. You know, you referenced President Biden's trip over there. October 18th, he essentially forecast what was going to happen and, and implored Israel not to let their shocked and grieving state dictate the course of this war to learn the lessons mm -hmm. that America learned on September That's 11th, correct. completely ignored. October 7th was a truly uh, defining and, and soul-wrenching moment for the entire nation of Israel. But it, it felt like from that moment, it, it's indicative to me of Israel's inability to, to listen to, to, to Washington's guidance. This campaign in Gaza is unlike any conducted by a modern state, including the U.S., anywhere. It is a campaign whose dimensions we and Israel had no conception of on October 8. The tunnel network, the depth, the sophistication of the networking, the size of the Hamas military, 25 to 30,000 well-trained, disciplined, structured, well-armed. We knew there were tunnels. We knew there were Hamas forces, but not at this scale. And the willingness, not just willingness, the calculation that by civilians dying, Israel would have one of two options. Either it could not strike facilities because civilians would be killed, thus preserving the Hamas military terrorist elements there, or it would hit an international opprobrium, international pressure, would attrit Israel's ability. The cold-bloodedness of Hamas's calculations here, this is hugely difficult. Israel's goal of eliminating Hamas is not achievable, full stop. And 
don't look to me for that analysis. Look to the most senior members of the Israeli security establishment who have made exactly that comment. They have diminished and degraded dramatically the military threat. Absolutely. But Hamas remains a potent force in Gaza. Now, to the extent this coalition is not prepared to accept that, that complicates enormously the ability to get to a day before that allows a day after of stabilization, Arab participation, ultimately reconstruction to take place in Gaza. We, the U.S. administration, President on down, other partners of Israel, friends of Israel, have reflected that over and over again, that without that political vision, without a clear willingness to see that credible pathway to a negotiated two-state outcome, you're not going to be able to get to any of the first and second and third steps necessary to avoid Gaza becoming a true, desperate, desperately suffering and miserable breeding ground for endless radicalization and threat. There is very little signage from this current government that that is something they're even willing to entertain. I will, I will tell you, I'll, I'll give you a response, which I know is never satisfying, but it happens to be true. You know, Israel is a sovereign state. It makes sovereign decisions. Some of them we agree with and can support. Some we don't agree with. We have to assess what type of support is critical to long-term U.S. national interests as well as Israel's long-term national interests. That's hard. It's not a black and white thing. It's not a, a, a circle that can be instantly squared, if you will. It's really, really hard to do. And we are profoundly, I'm profoundly sensitive to the fact that this murderous terrorist group would cheerfully see the population of Gaza die, or the West Bank, or streets in other Arab capitals in advancement of its consistent Salafist political ambitions, which are a threat to every state in the region. Are you worried that Washington's full-throttled support of Israel over the course of this conflict is if not jeopardizing, certainly changing and potentially setting America's relationship back with the rest of the region? At a street level, there is no question that popular reaction and response ha has been quite negative. Look at the reflection, if, if you want to go to, to commercial issues, on American or perceived American brands. They're actually Arab franchises and managed, but they're seen as American. There's been a dramatic and sustained turn away on this. U.S., the view of the United States has, has diminished dramatically as a consequence of all this. But I would also point at this. In virtually every government in the Middle East, every one, the profound fear here is what happens if after all of this suffering, these horrific images, Hamas emerges as the victor. That's the real concern here, because Hamas's ambitions go way beyond Gaza and Ramallah, the West Bank. They go to the Arab world as a whole. That is a profound concern. You know, you speak of the street. It's hard for people in and of Middle Eastern background not to feel that their lives are worth less in the eyes of the U.S. administration over the course of the last year. I understand the feeling it is not, and I speak both as, as an analyst and a, a, a member of the administration, that is absolutely not the view. You could not have a more profound sensibility for the suffering. Ambassador Satterfield, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.